Hi, everyone. My name is Lori Peek, and I'm a professor of sociology and director of the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. I am so excited to be with you today to share seven lessons from 70 years of social science disaster research. To begin my presentation, I want to tackle this question of why do social scientists study disasters? I know I have been asked this countless times because people, I think sometimes they hear about disasters, they think they're sort of the purview of meteorologists or engineers or others in more technical disciplines. But I say that social scientists study disasters because disasters are inherently social events. And so I want to begin with a brief history of how and why social scientists got involved in the study of extreme events. We typically point to Samuel Henry Prince's dissertation. He was a doctoral student at Columbia University in 1917 when the Halifax munitions explosion occurred in Canada and he was captivated. He ended up traveling to uh, Nova Scotia to study this event and he wrote a groundbreaking dissertation called Catastrophe and Social Change. And that research actually foreshadowed many of the concepts and concerns that would eventually become central to the social scientific study of disaster, including, for example, he focused on the short and longer term impacts of that explosion, uh, mutual aid and helping behavior, the role of blame and rumors in shaping emergency response and recovery, and also social organization and disorganization. Decades would pass, however, until social scientists really began to study disasters systematically. This, most researchers in the social science side really point to the beginning of our field in the late 1940s and early 1950s, following the end of World War II, as the United States was entering into the Cold War. There was a great deal of concern at that time in our US history about how the American civilian population would respond under conditions of extreme duress. And this led the United States military to actually begin to fund a small cadre of social science research teams to have them go out into the field after tornadoes, train derailments, earthquakes, and other unexpected events to study human behavior in the aftermath of these events. The assumption of those early funders was that people would panic and that chaos or social disorganization might ensue. But very quickly, the number of case studies began to mount that showed that the reality was actually quite different than the assumption about human behavior in disaster. And so the military pretty soon lost interest in funding these early field research teams but fortunately, the National Academies of Science, as well as the National Science Foundation, really saw the value in social science research in the context of disasters. And so they picked up where the military left off and really continued to support and cultivate this emerging area of study. It's important to underscore that from the inception of the disaster research field, Researchers have been driven by more than just a focus on applied questions. They have also been driven by a strong curiosity and a desire to contribute to core social scientific knowledge by learning from these collective stress situations. So consider what one of the pioneers of our field, Charles Fritz, had to say when he wrote that disasters, quote, break the cake of custom of the pre-disaster form of life rendering social processes more visible and social problems more apparent. Now, even though these early social scientists did have these broader theoretical visions about what the study of extreme events could contribute, we know that those initial funding sources from the military and the applied orientation led to a heavy emphasis on acute onset disasters such as floods and tornadoes that are prevalent in the United States. 
versus more diffuse emergencies such as famines or epidemics that occur more frequently in developing countries. The pioneers of the field of disaster research recognized the need to broaden out this initial emphasis, even as the study of disasters has in many ways remained highly event-driven, although newer paradigms that are focusing on sustainability, justice, and the social roots of risk have continued to further broaden out this area of inquiry. Now, I'm going to turn to seven major lessons, and they're certainly not the only lessons that have been learned over the years, but for the purposes of this brief introduction, that's how I'm going to organize my comments. But note that while my primary focus in this presentation will be on findings from sociology and other social science disciplines, I want to acknowledge the key contributions of many other disciplines in this area of study, such as public health and medicine, the humanities, and engineering and the natural sciences. All have contributed a great deal to the multidisciplinary and increasingly interdisciplinary study of disaster. Okay, so here we go. Lesson number one, there is no such thing as a natural disaster. Not only is that a phrase from an influential volume that was published in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, it has also long served as a rallying cry among social scientists who strive to focus attention on the social processes that turn natural hazards into human disasters. As others have argued elsewhere, the problem with this term natural disaster is that it puts the emphasis on the word natural, subtly shifting responsibility away from the fact that disaster losses really emerge from historical, economic, political, and social root causes. In fact, as sociologist Robert Bullard has argued, quote, what many people call natural disasters are in fact acts of social injustice perpetuated by government and businesses on the poor, people of color, the disabled, the elderly, the homeless, those who are transit dependent and non-drivers, groups least able to withstand disasters. Of course, forces of nature such as earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, heat waves, and so forth can trigger disaster. The severity of the crisis that follows, however, is not simply a function of wind speeds, rainfall amounts, ground motions, or temperature extremes. It is the interaction between the natural hazard, the condition of the built environment, and the status of the social structure and economic context that shapes the landscape of risk. It is also the interaction between the environment and society that influences whether a disaster will follow. Second lesson, key typologies and shifts in terminology have shaped our focus in this field and particularly what we do and historically have not focused on in the field. I will use the term disasters throughout most of this presentation today, but it is important to note that given their social nature, that social scientists uh, have tended to treat emergencies, disasters, and catastrophes as analytically distinct. So these terms have long been debated and there are literally entire books that have been written trying to understand the differences in terms of the scale and impact of emergencies versus disasters versus catastrophes. But there is a general agreement that the differences in terms of scale is associated with the seriousness of impacts to human and other environments, the entities who respond uh, to the events, the level of public participation in providing assistance, and the degree of recovery challenges that follow. So if we want to think about this, for our purposes here, an emergency is really defined as a narrow scope incident, such as a house fire, um, a vehicle accident, or a limited hazardous material release, 
where a fire department, police department, or other emergency medical agencies might be able to deal with a specific emergency and there would be little, very little sort of wider spread community disruption. A disaster, on the other hand, actually is defined by, in many ways, by its disruption at the community level. And so a disaster is something that causes much wider spread damage, suffering and loss and disruption to routine functioning. And so a disaster oftentimes also ha has a much longer uh, recovery period after an emergency and requires many different entities in terms of the response. And if we want to think about sort of even a larger scale event, that's when we oftentimes refer to a catastrophe. These are events that have a large scope of impact that oftentimes affect not just multiple communities, but perhaps even multiple uh, states or even nation states. These events produce high levels of physical damage and societal disruption and a disruption to all essential services. The recovery from catastrophes is oftentimes measured not in months or even in years, but may need to be measured in decades or even some people are arguing in terms of generations because of just the broader scale of impact. In addition to differentiating between emergencies, disasters and catastrophes, there has been a long history in our field of also dis differentiating between different disaster agents. And so oftentimes writing in this field does distinguish between natural hazards, technological hazards, episodes of mass violence, such as terrorism or school shootings, and then riots. And there has been a good deal of writing about how different disaster agents may provoke different community level responses. And so for example, in natural hazard events, there's sort of this long time of writing about how natural hazards may lead to community solidarity, which is something I'm going to talk about in a moment. But then beginning in the 70s, 80s, 90s, when researchers started focusing more intently on technological hazards and environmental injustices, they introduced into the lexicon the idea of the corrosive community that sometimes where litigation is involved after a technological hazard that communities, rather than coming together, may actually be torn apart. And so that's just one concrete example of how the literature has really tried to understand how do these different disaster agents, again, perhaps lead to a different type of community level response or to a different psychological or emotional or behavioral response from impacted populations. Third lesson, disasters have important temporal and spatial dimensions that must be considered. And so one of the things that's important to note is that early definitions of disaster that were introduced in the 1950s and into the 1960s tended to depict disasters as events that were, quote, concentrated in time and space in which society or one of its subdivisions undergoes physical harm and social disruption such that all or some of the essential functions are disrupted. And so that definition, we might depict disaster like this, where we look at that and we think there is a clear beginning to that disaster. There's the disaster event unfolding maybe over a period of seconds, minutes, hours, or days, but that event is concentrated in time and space, and then there is a clear end to that event. Over the years, as researchers started writing more and more from the social vulnerability paradigm in the field, those early definitions began to be challenged by scholars who started to argue that we need to think about disasters not so much as concentrated in time and space, but instead we need to look at disasters as really related to progressive layers of vulnerability that have unfolded for decades, if not centuries before the event, culminating in the event and then continuing to layer after the event. 
So another way of depicting this and sort of unpacking that, what do we mean by progressive layers of vulnerability? Rather than treating a disaster as sort of a discrete event that is devoid of historical and social context, instead we might talk about what patterns of racial and gender injustice, economic inequality existed before the event? What was the status of the built environment, the natural environment of land use planning and so forth? And so those may be the pre-existing conditions that then again, turn a natural hazard into a human disaster. And then also this framework invites us to look at the fact that recovery is not necessarily a linear process that follows a disaster and that there is not a single recovery trajectory that individuals, families, or communities would follow. Instead, we know that some people are, they regain equilibrium after a disaster. They maybe a year out, they end up being sort of like they were before, but others actually may be able to mobile, especially those who are situated um, maybe more wealthy or socially situated in ways where they are able to mobilize resources, they actually may end up better off after a disaster. While recent scholarship has shown that communities of color, low income populations and populations with less income, those inequalities may be deepened during the disaster recovery process. And so that sort of thinking about disaster, again, not as concentrated in time and space in a singular event, but instead as a process is really how many scholars in the field today approach the study of disaster. Fourth lesson, pro-social behavior, not panic, is common in the aftermath of disaster. And so this again is hearkening back to those earliest field studies that were conducted in the 40s and the 50s in response to the military's questions about human behavior in disaster. But this finding is perhaps one of the most robust social science findings across the disaster field about sort of how do people def uh, behave. And so I wanted to tackle this with all of you today because we know that one of the most common misperceptions about human behavior in disaster is that people will panic. But the reality is that panic or a state of confusion triggering unreasonable behavior is actually quite rare in disaster. Although many otherwise understandable behaviors sometimes get labeled as panic. And so we can think about, for instance, when people who are not told to evacuate, but they decide to evacuate in advance of a hurricane, they maybe get labeled as if they're panicking, but they were really making a choice to move out of harm's way. And so what decades of research have shown that rather than panicking in the face of crisis or descending into a state of shock or helplessness, the most common behavioral response in the aftermath of disaster is actually for people to support one another. I oftentimes say that rather than looting, rioting, panicking, and stealing the shirt off somebody else's back, what is much more likely is to actually take the shirt off of your back and to try to help your neighbor. And in fact, some of the earliest disaster researchers were so taken by what they saw in the aftermath of behavior, the mutual aid, the helping behavior, that they labeled this the altruistic community or a therapeutic social system response that is likely to emerge in the aftermath of these extreme events. And in fact, one recent study showed that in landslide hazards, that some 77% of survivors of landslides are actually rescued by their neighbors rather than by outside emergency responders. And so this is just yet another lesson that sometimes your social networks literally may save your life in the face of a disaster. Fifth lesson, disasters far from being equal opportunity events we know oftentimes exacerbate pre-existing social inequalities. Some of the early scholarship on disasters because of its focus on acute onset events and also that immediate response period in the aftermath of disaster 
that did reveal these positive behaviors in some ways perhaps overstated the power of disasters. Some of that early writing, the power of the disasters to change the social order, I should say. Some of those early writings in this area actually called disasters the quote unquote great equalizers. But research that followed in the decades after the 1970s when the social vulnerability paradigm was really introduced into the field recognized that far from being great equalizers, what oftentimes happens in disasters is that groups who are living at the margins before disaster suffer disproportionately when disaster occurs and then have the hardest time recovering in the aftermath of disaster. We oftentimes refer to this as the vastly uneven landscapes of risk that then translate into unequal exposure and unequal disaster impacts. And so social scientists from a range of disciplines have found that disaster risk, like other forms of environmental injustice, is patterned in ways that reflect pre-existing social and economic inequalities. And so groups that are marginalized and have less power and resources, um, they oftentimes, again, have a harder time preparing for responding to and recovering from disaster. Some of the groups that have received the most attention in the disaster literature include people who are living in poverty, people of color, women, children, the elderly, persons with disabilities, and renters in terms of groups that, again, experience pre-disaster marginalization, disproportionate impacts, and oftentimes protracted and delayed recovery periods. A sixth lesson that we have learned from decades of disaster research has to do with who does the work in this field. And it's important to underscore that disaster management is not just a domain of specialists. It becomes the responsibility and field of action for many different individuals, groups, organizations, and institutions who are working across multiple scales from the local to the international and are also working across the disaster life cycle from preparedness to emergency response to recovery to mitigation. And in sociology at least, some of the really interesting work that has been done from an organizational sociology frame has looked at how different organizations that are involved in disaster response, recovery or mitigation, how these organizations may shift or morph in terms of their responses to disasters. So sometimes these are referred to as extending or expanding organizations. More recent work has looked at how people as well as organizations may in, be involved in improvisational activities in response to disaster. And so for those of you who are really interested in the organizational response, there is again a robust literature that has been written by sociologists, political scientists, and others who are really interested in this particular lens for understanding not just how we respond to disasters, but also how do we come together to mobilize people, resources, and institutions to try to reduce disaster risk. Seventh lesson, trying to understand the many and varied impacts of disaster, especially over time, is a difficult undertaking. And many scholars in this field have dedicated their entire careers to this question of how do we measure disaster loss. At the highest level, disaster researchers often focus on what I call the five Ds of disaster, deaths, damages, dollars loss, disruption, and displacement when trying to understand the actual impact of a disaster. So using these indicators at a macro scale has helped to paint both a good news and a bad news tale about disaster. On the one hand, many people point to the fact that overall mortality from disaster has declined over recent decades. Others point to economic losses as a clear indicator that risk 
is out running us as disasters to continue to cause many billions of disaster uh, losses around the world each year. It is important though, as we're trying to figure out disaster impact to dig deeper beyond these surface macro level trends to understand more about who lives and who dies and who loses what in disasters. So consider, for example, a recent global report that showed that of the 1.3 million people who were killed in natural hazards events over the past 20 years, people in the world's poorest nations were more than seven times more likely to die than equivalent populations in the richest nations. The United States and other high income countries have dramatically reduced overall disaster mortality, largely due to enhanced building codes and standards, stronger government enforcement of mitigation policies, advanced early warning systems and other interventions. So that's one story about disaster loss. Another story related to economic loss also varies, but overall we know that economic losses from disaster are on the rise globally. So according to a recent report, also a recent report on this that looked at the time span from 1998 to 2017, countries experiencing natural hazards losses that became disasters reported $2.9 trillion in economic losses. Um, and due to higher asset values, the United States alone accounted for about one third or 945 billion of those losses. And so while it is important to underscore that high income countries like the United States bear the brunt of absolute economic losses in disaster, it's low to middle income countries that suffer disproportionate losses that can erase decades of development progress. Now, diving a little bit deeper into the five Ds, it's also important to underscore that in terms of each of these Ds, there are multiple indicators that researchers oftentimes look at, again, both in the immediate aftermath of disaster, but as there has been more long-term disaster research over time, we're starting to see more and more rigorous studies that are really trying to track how do these impacts unfold in people's lives over the months, years, and even decades in some of the longest running studies in our field. So in terms of deaths and injuries, some projects have looked at not just deaths or mortality, but also physical injury and emotional and behavioral health. And while a meta review in 2003 showed that most uh, psychological studies of disaster were actually completed within six months of the event. And so much of what we knew about emotional health was really Again, a narrow slice in time. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, I'm glad to report that many scholars started conducting longer term studies of disaster so we could really chart mental health distress over longer periods of time. Um, similarly with damages, oftentimes researchers will assess damage to the built environment, ecological loss, agricultural and crop loss, loss of cultural property, and many other forms of destruction that may occur in a natural hazard or other disaster event. In terms of dollars lost, we know there are rigorous assessments of both so-called direct losses that may occur in the context of the disaster, but also indirect losses that are oftentimes traced to the longer term or ongoing disruptions that follow disaster such as related to business closure, school shutdowns, childcare closures that keep parents out of work, um, and critical infrastructure failures, such as loss of power, water, and uh, power and water that can also delay the response and recovery process. In, again, in the aftermath of Katrina, there has been an increasing amount of scholarship that has also looked at this fifth D of displacement. And that is referring to both temporary displacement as well as permanent displacement when more and more people are unable to return to their homes because of ecological loss or complete community disruption. Okay, so in closing. Your professor asked me to think about what are some of the key 
considerations for the future and where are we going in this field? So just like there certainly weren't only seven lessons that I could have shared today, I, that there are so many considerations for where we're going and I hope you all are gonna be a part of helping to chart our course. I'm just going to end today with five key considerations that two colleagues and I recently came up with when we were working on a meta review of the literature. So first consideration that into moving into the future, we are going to need more convergence oriented research that is deeply interdisciplinary, problem focused and solutions oriented. This is going to be key to addressing the grand social and environmental challenges that we currently face. Right now, we know we are living in a time of rapid climatic change, social change, growing inequality. All of these forces and many others are culminating in more and more disaster losses. If we are going to tackle these grand challenges, it's not going to happen in isolation. It's going to happen through us coming together across disciplines, across organizations, focusing on characterizing the problems, but also making sure that we are spending a, an equal amount of attention working on the solutions to these problems. Second key consideration for the future is that we need to make sure as we are doing disaster research that our ethical considerations are being given the same primacy as our research questions. And so what that means is that we need as researchers, when we are doing this work, we need to center our ethics and to ensure that we are always respecting the dignity of our participants in our studies, while also ensuring that our research remains as rigorous as possible and is advancing new knowledge. Third consideration, that it is critical that disaster research focus on the possibility for disaster justice in the 21st century. Such a shift could help us in the disaster field to build and strengthen ties with environmental justice and climate justice scholars, while also continuing to advance our applied and theoretical frameworks in the field. I argue that when these powerful insights merge from disaster research and environmental justice research, that we can see the possibility not just for exposing the social roots of environmental harm, but also for illuminating how we can move toward a more just and sustainable future. Fourth consideration. We must acknowledge the strengths and capacities of the people that we study. Sociologists have long pointed out that those who are affected by disaster are not just helpless victims waiting to be saved. And it is clear that adults as well as children and youth have enormous strengths and capacities that can transform disaster preparedness, mitigation, response and recovery efforts. But even with this frame in mind, we know that much social science has continued to focus on disaster related disparities, inequalities and vulnerabilities. And this is absolutely understandable given our focus on patterns that shape our social world. But this is also equally important as we continue to uncover those patterns of injustice that we also look for patterns of capacity and strength. Fifth, there needs to be a major investment in promoting public disaster science alongside other forms of public scholarship. From the inception of this field, researchers have been driven by a desire to make contributions to both knowledge as well as to practice and policy. But to further these efforts, we're going to need investments in formal and formal institutional mechanisms that will help us to bring our disaster science to the broader public. Because the fact of the matter is, we've known for decades that mitigation saves, that for every $1 we invest in mitigation, we may save somewhere between four to $12, depending on the natural hazard type that we are considering. And so we know that mitigation saves, 
but we continue to see disaster losses escalate. So as we move into the future, it's going to take all of us in this field, taking our science and moving it into practice and into policy, but also into communities as we work to convey what we know so that we can help to reduce the harm and suffering from disasters. And so with that, I wanna thank all of you for your time and attention today. And I wanted to encourage you to please sign up for resources from the Natural Hazard Center, as well as from our Converge facility. We have many different lists with various opportunities. We have free publications, webinars, trainings, and other materials that we hope you will take advantage of and funding programs we hope you will apply to to support your research and the important work that you do. Thank you again, and please take care of yourself and others. <laughs>